Welcome everybody to this second webinar in a series of five with the title KFPS College Tour in which we will address five different topics all related to genetics to breeding as a kind of kickoff for the upcoming breeding season. So the first webinar was about uh, how we can apply breeding values and selecting mares and this second webinar we will talk about inbreeding, about kinship, what is inbreeding, what is kinship, why is it important for our breeding program and how do we deal with inbreeding and kinship within our population, within our breeding program. And I think the conclusion will be that there is a, a common responsibility for both the stud book and for the breeders and we will discuss all the items in this responsibility this evening. What is inbreeding? A horse is inbred or a foal is inbred when the, the, the sire and the mother are related. And when do we have two related horses? We have two related horses if they have common ancestors. And what determines the level of inbreeding? First, that's the number of common ancestors. The more common ancestors the two horses have, the father and the mother, the higher the inbreeding will be. And the second important factor is the distance between the common ancestors. And we measure that in number of generations. And the more generations the common ancestors are away from each other, the lower the inbreeding percentage is. Well, the inbreeding percentage of the inbreeding is uh, presented in inbreeding percentage and we do that since 1969 and it was uh, implemented by Dr. Geurts. He's also the person who is, uh, he was introducing the mare lines in our breed, the mare line books. Uh, many of you will know those books, we don't make them anymore but they are still available or at least the, the mare lines are still available uh, on the KFPS website. And since 69, the inbreeding percentages are uh, printed on our stud book papers. So when that has uh, raised a lot of awareness regarding inbreeding and uh, has also become a, a very important guideline in making breeding decisions to make sure that you make matings with an inbreed percentage that's uh, lower than 5%. Well, on this sheet I show you a couple of examples of uh, extreme inbreeding cases. For instance, uh, the inbreeding percentage of when a horse is mated to one of its parents. And then you see that we will have an inbreeding percentage of 25%. The same is true for two full sets, a full brother to a full sister you have an inbreeding percentage of 25%. With, with half sips, a half brother, half sister, it's 12.5%. And if we have cousins made it, full cousins, then you have an inbreeding percentage of six and a quarter percent. And it's all above the 5%, which is the standard that we apply in our breeding program. A 5% win in five generations. I will spare you the exact way we calculate the inbreeding percentage, but inbreeding percentage is half times the kinship between both parents. And I will I show you this uh, to show also the relationship between kinship and inbreeding. So the more kinship there is between both parents, the higher inbreeding percentage a foal will have. Another example of inbreeding is, uh, this time it's, it's a cow. Well, inbreeding principles are universal for all species. And uh, I show you this bull also to express that uh, not only horse breeding programs have, uh, have to deal with, with inbreeding, but also in other species, for instance in dairy cattle, there is also a problem with inbreeding. And this bull, he is actually ranking the number one net merit. It's a, that's a total merit index, which is used worldwide when we rank bulls. 
And so this is the number one bull in the world. And you see his pedigree and you see that this is a case of uh, extreme inbreeding. You see that uh, both his, his father and his mother have the same sire achiever. So they are actually, uh, it's a combination of two half, a half brother and a half sister. So that already leads to an inbreeding percentage of 12.5%. And also further down the pedigree, you see some common incest, uh, ancestors. You see a mogul showing up three times, and you see also the bull robust showing up a couple of times, and they also create some addition to his inbreeding percentage, which is close to 20% for this bull, so extremely high. So the, the largest contribution to uh, the inbreeding percentage is caused by Achiever, which is really close by in the pedigree, so um, only a few generations apart. And if you look at Robust and Mogul, the contribution to the inbreeding is lower because they are further down the pedigree. Just to give you an example how inbreeding works. So like I said, uh, inbreeding percentages are expressed on the uh, studbook paper since 1969. And this sheet shows the average inbreeding within five generations um, with uh, two decades apart, starting in 1960. So then the average inbreeding percentage was 6.7%. Well, that makes sense because uh, the inbreeding percentage itself was not introduced yet in, in our breed. It was only uh, uh, introduced in 1969. And you see that uh, the level of inbreeding went down in the next 20 years to 4.8 in, in the 1980s, 3.3% in, in the year 2000, and 1.8% in 2020. So that doesn't mean that the breeders now take more attention to inbreeding, but it shows that it has been a lot easier now to find a stallion for a mare that uh, leads to a low inbreeding percentage. So we see a, a decrease of, uh, of inbreeding percentage still uh, for the last uh, five and 10 years as well. So that's a, a good sign. That means that we, uh, that we don't produce foals with a high inbreeding percentage, but that doesn't necessarily mean that, uh, uh, that the, inbreed, uh, the inbreeding pro uh, problems on a, on a population level are all solved. It, uh, it means that on the individual cases in finding the right stallion for a mare, that uh, the inbreeding percentages are still at a, at a low level, and that's uh, very good to know. So why do we talk about uh, inbreeding so much within the Frisian horse or inbreeding in general? Uh, well, inbreeding has uh, quite a few of uh, uh, disadvantages. Uh, the first is that um, inbreeding causes that genetic flaws come to expression. So every individual, also you and me, has somewhere on the genome, on the DNA, uh, a genetic uh, fault and uh, those occur, uh, we call those mutations, and mutations are actually just a copy error uh, in reproduction from, from parents to, uh, to offspring. Um, in the copying of DNA, sometimes uh, there are uh, small faults that lead to, well, to genetic faults actually, and most of them are not coming to expression, and they uh, only come to expression when there has been um, done inbreeding. So if uh, the, the gene who is causing the disorder is coming double in uh, the genome of the particular horse, so has a, a double uh, failure on his DNA. So the most genetic flaws never come to the surface, but they come to the surface, they are getting expression by inbreeding. Well, we have a couple and I will uh, talk about them a little later. Second is that uh, Inbreeding leads to inbreeding depressions. You get more homozygotes in, instead of heterozygotes, and we, we know that, uh, that that has a, a, a negative effect, for instance, on fitness, and fitness is um, the collection of, uh, of several traits that, um, that have to do with uh, longevity, uh, with uh, 
with uh, health, with uh, uh, fertility. Um, and, and we see especially that, uh, that inbreeding has a negative effect on those traits, on those traits which we call the fitness traits. Because of inbreeding also, um, there is a reduction of genetic diversity. And we need genetic diversity to make selection. If there is no diversity, you cannot make a selection progress. So we need the diversity, and because of inbreeding, the diversity is reduced. So there's a couple of reasons that we should avoid inbreeding, especially to keep our horses, to keep our horse healthy. So what causes inbreeding? So when have you a risk of inbreeding in your population? First is uh, if you have a small population. If you have a very small gene pool, it's, uh, it's obvious that uh, the chance that you have uh, matings of, uh, of horses with common ancestors, uh, horses that have a higher kinship, that are related to each other, is higher in a small population than in a large population. Second is that uh, if you breed in a closed population, if you are not allowed to introduce um, stallions or mares from another, um, from, an, from another stud book, for instance, then you have a higher risk of inbreeding. Well, if we talk about uh, the KFPF, I mean, our population has a, has a decent size right now with 70,000 horses, but it has been uh, different in the past, and I will show you that later on. So we, are, we were a small population and we are a close population. So then you have double risk of, uh, of having inbreeding in your uh, population. But inbreeding is also occurring through selection. Selection is that you try to select the best genes. And that means that you select a way for uh, undesirable genes. But that also leads to less uh, diversity less genetic diversity and uh, well uh, selection has uh, been uh, intensified for instance to uh, due to reproduction technology I mean with the introduction of uh, artificial insemination uh, the use of uh, popular stallions has increased uh, dramatically second is also breeding value estimation if we have better tools to estimate which are the good stallions and the good mares so then the breed, the breeders will focus on those genetics and that means that you, uh, uh, your gene pool is getting uh, more narrow. Third, and that's the most extreme case of, uh, of reliable selection, is genomic selection. If you are able to identify the good genes on the, on the, on the DNA, for instance, uh, genes that uh, uh, are related to conformation or to movements, to gaits, to sportability, if you were able to do that and able to, to even better select the good genetics, that will lead to more inbreeding. It will also lead to a, shorten, a shorter generation interval. The sooner you know what the genetic value of a horse is, the, the earlier you can use that, uh, that horse, and that will shorten the generation interval. And we know that uh, a shorter generation interval leads to uh, a higher level of inbreeding. Well, especially also in, in our breed, in our population, we tend to use young stallions compared to other stud books, uh, horse stud books. And because of that, we will have uh, a higher chance of inbreeding because we uh, have a shorter generation in the fall than many other stud books. But how can we see that uh, a population is in danger uh, because of inbreeding? How do we have to view inbreeding on a population level? First is that, uh, that we uh, have to realize that the degree of inbreeding in a population is the result of um, the degree the horses in a population are related to each other. So what's the kinship among the horses in a population? So if you have a high kinship among uh, the horses in your population, you will have a higher risk of inbreeding. So for an individual horse, I already showed that if you uh, have a high kinship between both parents, that will lead to a high, uh, higher rate of inbreeding. And the same is true on a population uh, uh, level. If uh, the horses in your population have a high kinship, 
that will uh, lead to a higher level of inbreeding. It's good to know that uh, it's not the absolute level of inbreeding that's very important. It's, it's rather the increase of inbreeding, inbreeding per generation. And um, the reason is that uh, we know that, uh, um, that inbreeding that's caused by the first generations in the pedigree is, uh, is mo much more dangerous than inbreeding that is uh, taking place further back in the pedigree after many, many generations. So that's why it's, uh, it's not uh, very important to look at the absolute uh, level of inbreeding and it's more important to look at the increase of inbreeding per generation. So more specific for uh, the Frisian horse population and find the reasons for, for inbreeding. And I think this graph shows exactly uh, what the reason is. And you see uh, vertical, the number of registered uh, fillies per year. And on the horizontal, you see the different years those foals are born. The stud book is uh, founded in 1879, and you see that the number of foals born and registered in those times, those years, is extremely low. It's between 0 and 100. Well, you may have read the, uh, the articles in the, of the old times that in, in the year 1917, there was only three approved stallions, so that means that all foals born in those years were from three, only three stallions. We know the stallion Danilo, he was born in 1924, and if you would have the pedigree, the full pedigree of a foal born today, and you would uh, ride it out in, in 15 generations, till 1879, I think this uh, stallion Danilo would show up at least 500 times. So that's the inbreeding um, in, 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 the, in, in the past, but that still has uh, an influence on the absolute level of inbreeding. And that's also a reason that we shouldn't take too much attention to that. Another example, because we saw an increase around 1940, and then we see a, a decrease again uh, in 1970, 70 when horses were not used as much anymore uh, for agriculture purposes. And exactly in, in those years, we had a very popular stallion that, uh, well, that uh, is still one of the most uh, influential um, stallions, impact stallions of our breed, that's Ritzke. He was born in, in 57. And he had 50 offspring, 50 foals registered in 1965. And in that year, there was only registered 265 foals, and that means that 19% uh, that of the foals were by Ritzke. Another 45 foals in 1965 were sired by sons of Ritzke, and that means so that 40% of the foals were by Ritzke or had Ritzke as a, a grandfather from the paternal side. So that means that in those years, there was uh, a lot of full sips, half sips, especially half sips in the population. So the kinship of the horses in those years was extremely high. So you can imagine that the level of inbreeding in those years were also, was also very high. Well, after that one, uh, the Frisian horse was re-discovered uh, um, as, a, as a horse for, for leisure, for riding, for sport. You see the number of foals increasing. And today we are at about three and a half thousand registered foals a year worldwide. So inbreeding has not been a choice. It's just a result of the fact that uh, the number of Frisian horses uh, until 1980, 1990 has been uh, rather small. And I already showed you that, uh, that you have uh, a higher risk of inbreeding when you are breeding in a small population. So what's our approach? How do we deal with inbreeding? What's our policy? And actually we use a, a two-track policy if it comes to inbreeding. First is that we select 
against the genetic flaws that have been uh, caused by inbreeding. So that's one thing. On the other hand, we, uh, we're trying to reduce the increase of inbreeding. So not the absolute level of inbreeding, but the increase of inbreeding. And the one doesn't go without the other. If you only decrease your, uh, your inbreeding, then uh, it will not automatically lead that your genetic flaws will disappear. On the other hand, if you only select against your genetic flaws and you don't reduce the increase of inbreeding, well, you may have tackled one of the genetic flaws, one of the problems, but new problems will, uh, will pop up very soon because of that you have uh, continued your inbreeding. So how do we select against genetic flaws? First is that we have to uh, identify uh, the causal mutation uh, on the genome. Well, you know that for, for dwarfism, for uh, hydrocephalus, that's two uh, genetic disorders, uh, where we found the causal mutation in, uh, in 2014, and we have developed a DNA test for these both disorders, and we can test our, uh, our, our animals, our horses that we use for our breeding program. So uh, the stallions, uh, of course, are all tested, but also our mares that are used for breeding, the star mares, but also uh, studbook mares that, have, uh, that are uh, bred. They, are, uh, they have been tested so, uh, so that, you, uh, that you know exactly what the status is of the horses you're breeding with. Well, then you have to make, uh, to, uh, make a choice that's very important. What do you do with the horses that carry uh, one of the disordered genes? Well, we have decided to, to not exclude carriers from our breeding program. So we know that, uh, that about one out of seven, one out of six of our horses is carrying the gene for dwarfism, and the same is the case for hydrocephalus. And that would mean that, uh, that we would exclude, exclude about a third of our population for breeding. Well, you can imagine that if you reduce your, uh, your breeding population with a third, that would lead to uh, an increase of inbreeding again, and that would lead to new problems. So uh, we decided that it is not wise to exclude carriers from your breeding program. Of course, you test them and you publish which ones are carrier. And what you have to do is that you have to make sure that you make not matings of two carriers, so you don't uh, make risk matings. And that's one of the most important things. Also, when you make a decision uh, which stallion to use, is that you look at the status of your mare in, in, in terms uh, if she's a carrier or not. And if she's carrier, you, uh, you have to check whether the stallion you want to use, uh, whether he's a, a carrier or not and you have to exclude matings of two carriers. Well, this is uh, the classic Mendelian inheritance, and this picture shows that if, if you have two carriers, if both the mare and the, and the stallion are carrier, you have a 50% chance that also the offspring are carrier the gene, so they are not affected, but they are carrying the gene. 25% of the offspring will be affected, and that's what you have to avoid. And 25% out of this combination, about, uh, out of this mating, is free for the gene. But these type of matings should be avoided. They should not be done. And I think uh, in one of our uh, next webinars, when we talk about uh, stallion selection, which uh, stallion to use on your mare, I think this, is, uh, this will be stressed as well as one of the most important things that you have to make sure that you don't mate two carriers for the same disorder. What is the status of the genetic flaws we are uh, dealing with? I already uh, stressed hydrocephalus and dwarfism. Uh, that we have uh, identified the mutation on the genome um, and that we have a test since uh, 2014, uh, that we have uh, tested our breeding population and that we uh, make sure that we don't make uh, matings of two carriers. The second is uh, megasophagus. 
Um, that's a, a problem that uh, occurs about 1% uh, of, uh, of the folds are, um, are having megasophagus. And we did the same uh, research as we did with hydrocephalus and, uh, and dwarfism. Uh, that's research done in the Netherlands and in Belgium, in Wageningen, Utrecht and Ghent. And uh, so far we haven't uh, uh, a result in terms of a mutation or a DNA test to use. And recently we have started up uh, a new research in the United States um, with uh, Fenway Foundation, who is an important partner of KFPS in dealing with these uh, genetic disorders. And we will um, uh, use a more advanced method in order to uh, identify the mutation on the genome. In order to, uh, to make sure that we have uh, a DNA test soon, uh, also uh, we have to figure out what uh, exactly the genetic uh, mechanism is. It's, um, it's, it's not very likely that it's as easy with, uh, as with hydrocephalus and dwarfism. Uh, we expect that it might be a little more uh, complicated. But anyhow, it should lead to a tool that can be used by our breeders uh, to avoid uh, mating uh, two uh, horses that have higher risk for megasophagus. The same is true for aortic rupture. Uh, we feel that's uh, a little bit in the same area, so um, we are rather confident that uh, in the next couple of years we will have a, a genetic tool to uh, identify the carriers for these both disorders. A little bit uh, more difficult, or maybe uh, a lot more difficult, is uh, insect bite uh, hypersensitivity, IBH. Um, it's a uh, hypersensitivity um, against some, um, um, uh, some insects, um, and uh, well, which uh, is uh, a, a problem in, in, in many breeds, but also in the, in the Frisian horse. Well, and to compare with hydrocephalus and dwarfism, we compared 10 hydrocephalus folds with 10 healthy folds, uh, uh, and with IBH we compared 200 uh, IBH horses with 200 horses that didn't have IBH and we still were not able to, uh, to find the, um, the causing mutation on the genome. And uh, that means that there's most likely more genes involved than just one, which is the case for hydrocephalus and dwarfism. And uh, so it's, it's going to be uh, a lot of research to be done to figure out the mechanism. And in the meanwhile, we have uh, um, uh, to make sure that, that our horses that are uh, suffering from IBH, uh, that they are uh, in contact with, uh, with the insects. There are some, uh, some feed supplements that are helpful and on the market right now. And uh, so there is a lot of research going on to... Uh, to figure out which uh, uh, supplements are uh, really helpful. A new development as well is that there is um, uh, a launched uh, serological test so that you can, with a, with a blood sample of a horse, that you can see whether this horse is um, uh, sensitive for IBH or not. And that could help us, for instance, in stallion selection as well to, uh, to make sure that, that stallions we approve are not uh, sensitive, hypersensitive for insect bites. So that's something that uh, uh, right now we are working on if, if that could be uh, helpful. Well, fitness is, uh, is uh, um, uh, a combination of, of many traits. Uh, we are doing research right now to, uh, to uh, have, for instance, breeding values for um, longevity. So we know that uh, the offspring of the one stallions are, uh, have a higher lifespan than the other, and that's uh, important to know. And that could be something that we could uh, select our stallions for. So, uh, so that's research that's done. Um, we feel that um, if we talk about, uh, for instance, uh, fertility, that uh, the quality of, of semen, which is also caused by, uh, by inbreeding, a reduction of it, is that we, uh, that we make some progress uh, in that area. Uh, because we see fewer stallions that don't meet uh, the criteria these days, so that means that the selection criteria we also have uh, in our rules have uh, also helped to reduce uh, the problems with, uh, with semen quality. Um, we also, of course, have uh, a mare fertility, and that's a very difficult uh, one to, uh, to measure, so also uh, a difficult one to tackle, so it will take a long time be, before we have, uh, before we have uh, some more 
a grip on, on, on those problems in terms of, uh, of mare fertility. But that's something uh, really an, an area where we will focus on in the future as well. So that's a little bit about uh, the current status of uh, the genetic flaws, what we have done, where we are at and what we expect. So as a stud book, how do we deal with, uh, with inbreeding? What's our policy? First is that you have uh, to set an objective. What do you want to achieve? The second is that you have to formulate a policy, how you want to uh, achieve those goals, those objectives. Third is that you have to introduce tools uh, that can be used for selection in order to, uh, to reduce inbreeding. And the last, which is uh, really important as well, that you, uh, you have to make sure that there's commitment from your breeders as well to, uh, to uh, make sure that, you, uh, that the goals that you have set will be realized. So I will go down to this list and start with the objectives. The first objective, of course, it's the same as what I uh, explained earlier, that we select against genetic flaws. So that's, um, we want to have a healthy horse that, uh, that doesn't have uh, genetic flaws. And the second, and that's a, a very important uh, objective, is that, uh, that we want to reduce the inbreeding percentage per generation. And we aim to have an uh, increase of inbreeding per generation that's less than 1%. And that's a goal that's determined by uh, the food, uh, food and Agriculture Organization under United Nations, the FAO. And uh, they have set that goal for all species. So that's um, a universal goal. And um, uh, why uh, do we aim to have an uh, increase of uh, no more than 1%? Well, the theory is, and that's also confirmed by research, is that uh, at that level of inbreeding, so if you have around a 1% uh, of increase of inbreeding, the number of uh, genes that you lose because of inbreeding is about the same as the number of new genes that you uh, create through mutations. So if the inbreeding is higher than, inbreeding increase is higher than 1%, you lose more uh, genes than you create by mutations. And if you're lower than 1%, it's, uh, it's the other way around. So as a KFPS, um, uh, like 10, 15 years ago, we, we, sent the, we set the, the objective that we, uh, that we would make sure that our inbreeding percentage uh, would be below 1%. And I will show you later on whether we succeeded in that or not. Second uh, is that you have to uh, make sure that you have a good policy to, uh, to realize your objectives. Uh, first is that we have uh, prioritized health in our breeding program. In the past, uh, the breeding program was uh, about, uh, well, the breed characteristics, about uh, movements but there was no uh, line written about our health, of the health of our horses. And these days, uh, health has uh, become very important in our breeding goal. And we can try to breed uh, a beautiful horse. We can try to breed a horse that's uh, successful in sport, but it all starts with a sound and healthy horse. So that's why it's very important in our breeding goal. Second is that we have um, promoted that uh, an outcross pedigree is a quality. So a, a horse that has a high predicate or a high breeding value or uh, is a good sport horse, that's a quality. But also the fact that the horse is, uh, is low kinship, is outcross, is, has become a quality. Third is that we have uh, made rules to make sure that the impact of individual uh, stallions is uh, is uh, restricted. So if we have uh, the U, if, if some stallions are used too much, like Ritzke in 1965, uh, that will lead to many half sips and to a higher rate of inbreeding. And the fourth part of our policy is that we have broadened our, um, our breeding goal. So if you select for only one trait, you can imagine that you have only one ranking, only 
uh, one stallion on the first place. And if you have several items in your breeding goal, like today with uh, confirmation uh, breed characteristics, with uh, sport aptitude, with uh, character, with health, you have uh, different uh, uh, items in your breeding goal and that will also lead to more uh, variety in, in stallions uh, who are um, uh, in the top of those lists. And every breeder is setting also individual standards or uh, preferences or what they feel is important. So that leads automatically to uh, a wider spread of stallions used. So it's very important to have some broadening in your breeding goal. So then we have the tools. That's the last part, also a task of the stud book to, uh, uh, to make tools available for, for breeders to, to use. So the first is uh, the breeding limits in order to, uh, to limit uh, the use of individual stallions to a certain degree. Uh, second is that we have uh, inbreeding calculation if you make uh, a choice of, uh, of stallion so that you can uh, calculate the inbreeding percentage between uh, your mare and the stallion you want to use. And also uh, kinship has been uh, shown a very powerful uh, tool uh, to decrease our inbreeding. And I will go to the tools, the three tools that we have been uh, introducing. So the first is the breeding uh, limit that was introduced uh, in, the 90, uh, in the 90s of the previous century. And actually the breeding limit is preventing excessive, excessive contribution of individual stallions uh, in our breed. Uh, I showed you that Ritzke had uh, about 20% impact in 1965. And science says that the maximum contribution should be no more than 5%. And uh, so that you have make to, to make sure that you have a limit um, formalized that uh, makes sure that you don't have uh, a more contribution of an individual stallion per year of 5%. So we have uh, introduced that uh, the breeding limit, it used to be different in the past and this is uh, um, determined in, in 2005 that young stallions can only breed 180 uh, mares a year. And we only have a limit for uh, non-approved stallions. So non-approved stallions, young stallions are used on the, the top of our mares so they have a, a higher contribution on our breed compared to, uh, in general, than compared to, uh, to older stallions. So that's why we don't have a limit for, uh, for breedings for stallions that have been approved on offspring. So that's tool number one, the breeding limit, which has been uh, rather um, effective. So our second tool is uh, the inbreeding calculation. Well, actually, that's uh, uh, carried out when uh, Dr. Hertz introduced the uh, inbreeding percentage in 1969. Um, you could uh, calculate inbreeding, well, not through uh, the website like it is these days, but you could uh, apply for a list of, uh, of inbreeding percentages of all stallions with your mare. And that was, uh, and that was used a lot. And, uh, well, it has a direct effect uh, because it avoids narrow inbreeding for this individual horse. And uh, by having uh, a lower inbreeding on this individual foal, you also uh, avoid uh, also genetic disorders. But you have to realize that, uh, uh, that having in inbreeding percentages low on individual horses does not necessarily uh, tackle the problem of inbreeding in the entire population. And you may say, well, as long as everybody is uh, making sure that they make uh, matings with an inbreeding percentage lower than 5%, there should not be a problem on population level. But that's not true because after some years, there will not be available any stallions anymore that uh, in combination with your mare will lead to an inbreeding percentage lower than 5%. So there has to be done more. It has some slight indirect effect. Um, if you, for instance, have... Um, an offspring by beard, um, it will take many generations because you have, uh, you can use another stallion again uh, with blood of beard. So that uh, also reduces the impact of popular lines, popular, popular stallion lines, families. So there is some indirect effect of the uh, inbreeding percentages for um, 
uh, for individual matings. So this is actually the oldest tool that we are using since uh, the introduction of inbreeding percentage in uh, 1969. More recent is uh, uh, the kinship. I see this part has not been translated, or at least uh, the uh, tool three is uh, is kinship, and the kinship is um, the degree of which an individual horse is genetically related to the population. So if you have a horse that has uh, all the popular stallions that have been used a lot in the pedigree, you will have a horse with a high uh, relation to the population. You will have a horse with a high kinship. And if you have a, a horse with stallions in the pedigree that have not been used so influential, maybe not so popular, uh, then you will have uh, a horse with a lower kinship. Well, co kinship that varies between 15.5 and 20.5 with an average of 17.7. And the uh, kinship that uh, actually uh, identifies the outcross horses in the population. So if you have a horse with 16.5 uh, with or lower kinship, then you have a horse that's outcross and can contribute to uh, more genetic variation uh, in the population. And uh, kinship is uh, a criterion that's uh, both used by the breeders. I will show you uh, a graph later on, but it's also used for instance, uh, when we are selecting our new generations of stallions, because it's an obligation that we make sure there is enough uh, genetic variety among the, the approved stallions. So that means that kinship is a, an important selection criterion uh, when we select our new approved stallions. And what we have done as well is that we have the kinship introduced in the total merit index. For those who have uh, watched the first uh, webinar, They've seen that uh, by in, uh, uh, including kinship in the total merit index, uh, that index selection will not lead to an extra increase of, uh, of inbreeding. So uh, kinship, therefore, has been a, a very powerful tool to keep our inbreeding increase down. So like I said, it's both the breeders as uh, uh, the judges, the stallion judges who are uh, using uh, the kinship, and I, um, in this, uh, on this sheet, I have a table of uh, uh, the lowest kinship stallions that have been uh, selected uh, uh, in January last month uh, at a second, uh, second viewing. And these stallions have been uh, selected for, um, uh, uh, for the 70-day uh, test, or at least for the preparation of the 70-day test. And um, you can see that those uh, stallions are all 17.5 uh, kinship and lower, so below average on kinship. And you see, for instance, the one on top, it's catalog number 104, uh, Dries Y. Um, he has uh, the lowest kinship of all stallions that was presented on the first and second round of inspection. And you see that, uh, that his uh, uh, breeding values for conformations and, and movements are a bit lower than the average. But because he is a low kinship stallion, he was uh, selected. And um, actually, it's the task of the stallion uh, judges to um, at least give these, uh, these stallions with low kinship, as long as possible, the chance to, uh, to prove themselves. And well, you see, if you look at the average uh, breeding values for, um, for these low kinship stallions, that they are slightly uh, lower than the average, but they are still selected, and, they, uh, and that's uh, thanks due to their uh, lower kinship. And if you look at their total merit index, you see that they are uh, about uh, the same as, uh, as the, the, the average of the 41 uh, uh, selected stallions. This is uh, a picture I show every year, and I must be honest that uh, the difference between the low kinship stallions and, uh, and the average stallions is, is smaller than, than, uh, than normally. And that's uh, because of the impact of, uh, of Omer. Omer is uh, one of our lowest kinship stallions, but uh, he, uh, he performed very well in his offspring, his first uh, crop of offspring in 2020, with a star percentage over 70% and also very uh, high scores in this ABFP test that led, ha has led to, uh, to pretty high uh, breeding value. So 
you see this year that the low kinship stallions are not uh, far behind in, in breeding values for confirmation and, uh, and movement uh, compared to uh, uh, the average of the 41 selected stallions. At least if you compare it to, uh, to previous years. So there is uh, low kinship stallions that are discriminated uh, positively by uh, the stallion jury. Well, this is a picture I always uh, like to show. This is, uh, this uh, expresses, this shows the number of breedings of uh, Fabe. And uh, most of the time, uh, Frisian stallions, if they are young in their first two or three years, they're, they're doing the most breedings. Well, in Fabe, it was a little different. He had a peak in 2002 and because he was the champion of uh, the reserve champion of the stallion show in 2001 which gave a little boost to his, uh, his breedings. And after that, you, uh, you see that the number of breedings is going down again. And then in, in 2005, we introduced as KFPS the uh, kinship. So inbreeding percentage was introduced in 1969. Kinship was introduced in 2005. And you see that uh, his popularity uh, increased again. And that was, um, well, thanks to his low kinship. He was by then the lowest kinship uh, stallion available. So. Um, so uh, a kinship was also taken into account by your breeders when they uh, made their choice of, uh, of stallions. And uh, well, um, besides his low kinship, uh, Faber did, uh, did very well in our breed and he, uh, he became a preference stallion. But uh, well, you, this graph shows that, uh, that also our uh, breeders uh, uh, take attention to, uh, to kinship. So our goal was to, uh, to, to become below 1% uh, increase of inbreeding per generation. And this graph shows what, uh, what has happened in the last, uh, say, 20 years. And uh, in 1998, you see that the, uh, the increase of inbreeding per generation was, uh, was still over 2%. Uh, so that's, that's uh, way too high. The FAO, who set this standard of 1% per generation, actually says if you have an, uh, um, an increase of inbreeding that's more than 1% per generation, uh, your um, population is endangered, so your breed is endangered. So actually this shows that the Frisian horse was really endangered in, in those times, in, in the, in the, still in the 90s, even though the number of horses uh, had increased already for, for uh, one or two decades. Well, after that, you have seen that um, that was a decrease of the, of the inbreeding increase. And so the last, like, uh, six, seven years, we are around 0.5%, uh, which is uh, actually even half than uh, the norm, the standards. That's uh, uh, the, the FAO standard of 1%. So we are very happy with that. Um, if you compare that to other breeds, for instance, um, um, uh, KWPN uh, warm blood horses, dressage, they, uh, they are around uh, 0 0.6, 0 0.7, so we're even lower than that. Uh, their show jumping horses are slightly lower than 0 0.5. So we are at the same area as, uh, as compared to uh, warm blood breeding. So anybody, we are very happy with that. And that's uh, something that uh, we have to make sure that we stay at this level and, um, and uh, so we have to be careful and alert to make sure that uh, that we are not uh, have that we're not seeing an increase again and, and go over the one percent. So we have to be very keen on uh, this graph. So that's something that's been monitored every year very closely. Well, and back to selection and inbreeding. I told you earlier that uh, that uh, selection has a negative effect on inbreeding. And um, so uh, we have to make sure that there is a balance between uh, selection to, uh, to create genetic progress, to make sure that our horses are getting better. And on the other hand, that we make sure that our inbreeding is uh, at an acceptable level, like uh, shown in the previous graph. Well, one of the reasons is that we use uh, uh, breeding values, and, that's, uh, uh, and that has a negative effect on, on inbreeding, because if we have a better way in uh, identifying our good stallions, our good mares, then that will uh, lead to that these stallions are used more, these mares are more used more, and that will lead to more inbreeding. The same is true, or even more, for genomics. 
because uh, that will lead to a shorter generation in the fall and even a better way to identify our good horses. So that will lead to more um, inbreeding. And well, the same is, is true for uh, reproduction techniques. Uh, artificial insemination has been a very important factor that has, of course, uh, led to more inbreeding. So if we, uh, we will find the balance between selection, uh, intensity, uh, intensity and, and inbreeding, it's important to weigh our kinship in the total merit index. And I showed you that in the, in the, seminar of, uh, in the first seminar about breeding values. And this is again the, the top list of mares. Um, and, and this one is uh, ranked on uh, only um, uh, confirmation and, uh, and sport ability. And then uh, you see also in the, uh, in the fifth column that uh, these mares that are in the top of the list are all rather high on, uh, on kinship. So they are, the most of them are over 18%. And, uh, well, actually, that's proving what I said earlier. If you we, we use uh, estimating of breeding values and you rank those for, uh, for total merit, then uh, that will lead to more inbreeding. Well, this picture shows that because, uh, well, you see that the, the merits in top of the list are all uh, rather high on their kinship. All, most of them are over 18%. So if you include uh, 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 kinship in your total merit index, uh, you see in this list, and when you see, look at that top list, that there are still uh, some mares that are over 18%, but the average of these mares are a lot lower. You see uh, uh, the majority of the horses are, is below 18%, and there's even a couple of mares that is uh, at, uh, at 16 or 16.5%. So uh, that means that, uh, that these horses are getting credit because of their low kinship and that's helping them in their total merit index. So that means that if we select for our total index uh, that we will not have an extra increase of, uh, uh, of inbreeding. So with this we have found the balance between selection and uh, an acceptable level of increase of, uh, of inbreeding. And I only, only in the previous sheets, I only saw, uh, showed you the top 20. But if you analyze the top 20 mares of December 2020, and, and you look at the top list for confirmation and sport aptitude, and you compare that to the list of, uh, of the total merit index, you see that there is, uh, first, that there is uh, uh, more different fathers, sires in this list. So if you only uh, rank on uh, confirmation and sport aptitude, you have 21 different sires, with the total index you have 31. Well, then we have some, um, some stallions that have a large impact on a breed these days. For instance, Beard, he has in the, in the, in the first uh, top 100, he has 30 offspring. In the total merit index uh, list, he has 24. Alvin is from 18 to 12 and Norbert from 16 to 10. So you can see that uh, by this uh, total merit index where we have included kinship, that the, uh, the impact of the individual stallions is reduced. Well, if you look at the average kinship in the both top hundreds, then you see that uh, if you're not selecting or not uh, uh, weighing a kinship, that you have an average uh, kinship of over 18% with 80.3. And when you use the total merit index, you are at exactly the population average of 17.7. Of course, uh, uh, you win some, but you lose somewhere, somewhere else, and you see that the average breeding value for confirmation has dropped from 108.5 to 107.8. And the same is true for the gates from uh, 108.5 to 108.3, so that's a reduction of only 0.2 index points. Uh, in total index, you see that, uh, that uh, the top 100 of the total merit index is slightly higher. So by gaining half a point of kinship, you lose, um, well, say 0.5 index points for confirmation and, uh, and, and movements. So we, we feel that it is uh, acceptable in order to keep our inbreeding numbers down. So now I get to my last sheet. And that's actually the conclusions, inbreeding and kinship, how do we deal with it? And I say, well, it's a joint uh, commitment and joint responsibility of both KFPS and uh, the breeders. Well, KFPS has to make sure that uh, there is a good inbreeding policy, and uh, we have to make sure that we fine-tune that uh, that policy. We have to uh, 
monitor our inbreeding trends. Well, I showed you the graph and that uh, has gone uh, down to, uh, to about 0.5 uh, uh, percent per, per generations. Well, that's something that we have to monitor. It's also a task of KFPS. Uh, we have to make sure there is uh, selection tools for uh, the breeders to use, like kinship, like the inbreeding percentage in the past. And the last, and that's maybe the most important, is that we have to ensure, or that our judges have to ensure, that we have sufficient genetic vari variation uh, among our approved stallions to make sure that you have uh, plenty of stallions to use from to keep your inbreeding level down below the 5%. And uh, so that uh, enough different bloodlines are used. Well, the stallion jury is using that, like I explained, by also using uh, kinship and, and using the total merit index uh, when they are selecting stallions. Well, there's a responsibility for breeders as well. First is that we have to make sure that uh, we make matings uh, with an inbreeding percentage of uh, less than 5%. And, explained that this is uh, especially helping for this individual horse and uh, maybe not um, quite as much for the entire population but still it's important that uh, these matings are made. Um, second is that uh, uh, the breeders also uh, make sure that, that mares with, uh, with low kinship are valuable for, uh, for the breed and that they should be used for, uh, for breeding. And also that we have to include and that the breeders have to include uh, kinship as one of the selection traits where they select their stallions, their mating stallions. Uh, so this uh, shows an overview on, uh, on our responsibilities and what we have to do. But I think uh, that, we have, uh, that we can conclude that we, have, uh, that we are in a safe area now with our uh, increase of inbreeding of uh, around 0.5% uh, per generation. And we are, uh, we are happy with that, but that's something we have to, uh, we have to realize that we have to be extremely keen on, uh, on uh, keeping that way. So that was uh, the presentation of, uh, about inbreeding and, uh, and kinship. Uh, uh, if you have uh, questions, uh, you can always uh, send them to, uh, to the KFPS by email, and we will make sure that, uh, uh, that these questions also will be answered. So this was uh, the second webinar. We will have a, a webinar about uh, how we uh, judge our horses. And that uh, will, be, uh, that's, will be a talk of uh, Inspector Sabine Swaga. And uh, we also have uh, the fourth webinar, which will be about uh, how you make your choice of mating uh, stallion for your mare. And that will be presented by uh, Sietzke Oosterbaan. He is one of the members of our breeding council. And the fifth and last evening uh, will be some kind of a panel discussion with, uh, with uh, several breeders. Uh, and that will be led by uh, Alice Boyce. He is also uh, the editor of uh, the Friso magazine and also Friso.com. So thanks for being with us in this webinar. And stay tuned to our, uh, to our um, uh, college tour, the KFPS college tour. And uh, we... Uh, Hope to, uh, to welcome you again in the third webinar next week. Thank you very much.